Uh, thank you very much, Anne. Uh, as Anne mentioned, my name is Nick, and I am Salza's Queer Officer for 2018. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome back to this law school one of our most distinguished alumni, um, the Honorable Michael Kirby, ACCMG. Um, Michael, uh, Mr. Kirby, is one of those people who really doesn't require an introduction okay, per se. Well, let's get but let's 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 <laughs> <laughs> let's do it. Um, well, briefly, Mr. Kirby has been the chair of the Australian Law Reform Commission. He's been president of the New South Wales Court of Appeal, and as you will all know, he's been a justice of the High Court of Australia as well. Um, since leaving the bench, he has been chairman of the UN Commission of Inquiry <laughs> into North Korea. And uh, he has been a great supporter of many human rights initiatives, including those in the LGBTQI space. And we are very fortunate to have Mr. Kirby to be here with us this evening. So would you join me in welcoming Mr. Kirby? Now, Mr. Kirby, I'll do my best to channel my Lee Sales, Kerry O'Brien, but, um, you know, brace yourself. <laughs> I suppose I'll start off with the first question. How does it, did you ever envisage yourself uh, as an advocate for LGBTQI people and those issues? Well, LGBTIQ plus is a relatively new thing, so the literal interpretation of your question leads to the answer no, because <laughs> no one mentioned those, uh, that alphabetical soup uh, before about 15 years ago or so. Um, uh, did I ever think I would be sitting here talking openly about uh, human sexuality and my sexuality? Um, well, um, I was always a bit of a stirrer on this campus. I was elected twice to be the president of the Student Representative Council. I was elected before that to be president of the Law Students uh, Society and uh, I went on to be president of the union and uh, honorary life member of the National Union of Australian University Students as it was then. And that, uh, in that I followed uh, Sir Gerard Brennan who was uh, the former president of NUAUS. But um, specifically sexuality, no. But the logic of my life was that I would probably get involved in whatever were the um, issues of the day. And in fact, the question of my life is, what are the things you don't think you will be sitting here in 20 or 30 or 40 years time talking about that uh, you are not talking about now or would not talk about now? And that is the nature of civilization. It's a path, it's a journey, and our task as privileged, educated people is to continue the journey and to open up new corridors and to raise new questions, which is what I've basically been doing all my life. Well, on that point, on that journey, on your journey, um, what would you say has been the most noticeable change uh, towards or uh, change in attitudes towards LGBTQI people in Australia? Uh, openness. Um, and it's, it's basically the same for all of those areas in which Australia's law was uh, very uh, prejudicial and uh, discriminating back in um, the time that I was here. I was, I was president of the SRC in 1962, so I was around in the late 1950s and um, at that time we had white Australia. It was very difficult for people uh, of colour, people of different nationalities or ethnicities to get into this country. Even if they married someone, uh, it was very difficult for their spouse to come. Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Corwell, the, uh, the later member, the later uh, leader of the Australian Labor Party in the federal parliament and leader of the opposition and minister for immigration after the war said, uh, two wongs don't make a white. And that was said to be uh, humorous and Australians thought that was terribly funny at the time. But it was 
a symptom of the prejudice that we had about race. We've still got prejudice against race, prejudice against Aboriginal people, the, the unfairness. I mean, we go through this ceremony, and it's a good thing that we do, because it focuses our mind on the Indigenous people and the wrongs that have been done, especially by the law. But um, the prejudice against Aboriginals and the destruction of their economic capacity uh, is the cause of their deprivation and their um, disadvantages that they suffer right into the present time. Discrimination against women in the law, so much discrimination. I never questioned that discrimination. I never asked why uh, does a woman take her domicile from her husband uh, and uh, in order to found jurisdiction in the divorce court. Uh, so much prejudice that existed against women. It was very hard for women uh, to even become admitted as lawyers because the word in the Legal Practitioners Act was any person and the courts interpreted that as meaning any male because it had always been a male person, so the court said. And then there was the LGBTIQ uh, group uh, who were criminals and, and uh, who were locked up, who were harassed, uh, who were hated, who were discriminated against, and that lasted right into my time and exists to some extent today, certainly in 40% of our population. So, um, things were, were difficult. And the way they began to change was we began to have neighbours who were Asian Australian or uh, Black Australian, um, uh, African Australian. We began to know people who were gay. And uh, this makes it, it's much harder to hate a person if you if you know them. It's easier to hate them if you don't know them, you never meet them, or you think you never meet them. Uh, so I think that was the biggest change. People began to stand up. Why did they stand up? Well, they began to stand up because they began to realise that uh, the discrimination was irrational and unscientific. Once you come to that conclusion, then you have to do something about it. In my case, um, I was intellectually convinced of that, but I was a quiet little mouse for some years on this issue. But my partner, Johan, who was from the Netherlands, uh, was insistent, banged the table, was demanding that we should stand up. And he said, we have to do this for the young people coming along. And, uh, he was right, uh, and uh, when the AIDS epidemic came along in the 19, uh, 1980s, uh, I became involved in Australian and international initiatives. So that was a sort of code language of where I stood, what I was about. And Yohan became an Ankali, which is a sort of buddy who looks after people living with HIV. And so that was a sort of... Um, indication uh, of where we were, and anybody who was looking and paying attention would have put two and two together. But uh, eventually, uh, on Johan's insistence, uh, we uh, put it in who's who, and uh, that was a very sophisticated uh, way of doing it, and um, a few months later, it was seen by somebody in the media and reported, and that began a process that led to uh, a certain degree of nastiness because there was a deal. There was a deal. And the deal was, we know you're out there, we know there are a few of you, and we're insistent that you do not talk about this, that you be ashamed of it that you keep it very much to yourself. And if you do that, the deal is we'll leave you alone. And for a long while, I went along with the deal. But then I got to a point where uh, that was over. And that's why I'm here tonight. And I hope that's why some of you are here tonight. 
uh, straight or gay, we've got to end that deal. The only way we do so is by being honest. It's like being um, secretive about being left-handed. How many left-handed people are there in this audience? <laughs> Disgraceful. <laughs> <laughs> It's 11% of the human species, which is much more than gay people, exclusively gay people, but it's, it's something that is just part of our, the variety of the human kind, and uh, anybody who's got a problem with it has just got to get over it. That's what, that's what we ultimately decide it should happen. Well, on that, when you did list Johan in Who's Who, um, apart from media attention, like you say, a while later, was there, uh, did you receive any support or kind messages from colleagues or friends or you know, supporters? Uh, oh yes, we, we had, uh, of course, friends, many friends knew uh, of our situation. It's very hard in Australia, in suburban Australia, to live in the suburbs and for people not to know that there are two men living in, in this, this area. And uh, uh, so, uh, especially if they are sort of semi-prominent as I was in the uh, Law Reform Commission and in the courts. Um, but anyway, Mary Gordon was very supportive. And she insisted very soon after the story about Who's Who came out that uh, we, my partner Johan and I, should be given the same benefits uh, as the other justices of the High Court in terms of coming to Canberra. If you're a justice of the court, your partner, your spouse can come and get uh, a business class airfare and a Commonwealth car and all the trappings. Uh, Johan got nothing though he was the most faithful. We were the best family values in the High Court <laughs> because we rather liked Canberra. Most of the justices hated Canberra, poor things. <laughs> but um, we liked it and so he came down, but he got nothing. He just had to drive backwards and forwards. But anyway, Mary uh, said, we've got to put this on the table of a business meeting. And Mary's not a person that you mess with. And so it went on the table and then, um, as often happened in those days, there was a division of opinion. Three uh, supported uh, the giving of uh, the same benefits to Johan and me. Three opposed it. And I took no part because I was financially affected, so I disqualified myself. Um, and Mary Gordon said, Kirby, I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this for the principle. And the principle doesn't just affect you. This principle affects all the courts of this country. And unless as it is done by the High Court of Australia, it won't be done. So you have to vote. You are required. This is necessity. Necessity overrides your disqualification. You <laughs> must vote. I said, Yes, Mary. <laughs> and so uh, I voted, it was passed, a letter was sent somewhat reluctantly to the government of the day, the Howard government, and eventually, somewhat reluctantly, uh, Johan started to get uh, the benefits of um, other partners and spouses. And, and uh, I think that happened in a number of courts at the time, and now, you wouldn't have an argument about such matters. Well, taking you back to what you said about being attacked for who you are, um, I note that tomorrow marks the day of the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia, and you've just briefly mentioned a particularly, well, to say the least, unfortunate um, incident that happened in the early 2000s, which I'm sure a lot of our students here might not be aware of, but in 2002, I think, you were named in Parliament, or rather an accusation against you was made um, by a senator um, under parliamentary privilege, um, an accusation that was later found to be completely unfounded and false. Um, during that time, I suppose my question is, 
did you receive support from your judicial colleagues and what was the atmosphere like and upon reflection how much have societal attitudes changed in Australia since that incident? Uh, this attack on me uh, is e explained in a number of biographical works about me and anybody really wants to go and look at it can see it there or in Wikipedia and, uh, and uh, I don't want to revive it very much because uh, otherwise it sort of hangs around my head like an albatross and uh, it, it, as you say, it was all over in a week. Uh, it, it involved an accusation that was expressed in the federal parliament that I had used Commonwealth cars uh, to transport a sex worker from uh, Darlinghurst to my then home in Rose Bay. Now, my partner Jan, then of 30 years, now of 40 uh, nine years and four months uh, <laughs> was resident at this place. So the thesis was that I was getting a sex worker to go home and Jan would just quietly go upstairs and lock the door and, <laughs> and, and would ignore what was going on in the house around him. I mean, nobody sort of stopped to think about the realities of life. But um, the problem was that the, a Commonwealth driver had given the senator concerned a docket. The docket was said to be the docket showing judge travelled plus one and then when the, uh, the uh, passenger was sent home it was judge did not DNT, did not travel. Uh, and uh, so that was the foundation of the accusation. There is a principle of constitutional law and it's expressed in the standing orders of most parliaments in British and post-British countries that nobody may um, make accusations against a judge in parliament uh, except on a motion for the removal of the judge for proved incapacity or misconduct, which is the provision in the constitution. Uh, but the, the senator framed his speech in a way that my name and identity was left to the very last two words in his speech. Um, and therefore, there was no occasion for the president of the Senate to intervene to rule him out of order. And then he dropped it in the end. And he produced this docket. But the problem was uh, very quickly realised that in the docket were the names of some very prominent federal members of parliament. Uh, the Right Honourable Ian Sinclair, who had been the leader of the Nationals, uh, and the Honourable Laurie Brereton, who had been a, a minister in the Hawke government and the Keating government. And um, the, the uh, it was Mr. Brereton's family who, when this docket was published in the Sun Herald, uh, a facsimile of it was published, went into their parents on Sunday morning and said, uh, that can't be right because it has down that you travelled that day in that com car, but we were in um, Magnetic Island or somewhere in Queensland at that time. Um, for some reason they recognised the date and they said that that is not correct. Then Mr Sinclair got onto it and I mean people have diaries nowadays, everybody has an email trail but in that, at least in that time everybody had diaries so they went to it and it, it was completely, it was a fraudulent docket, it was just made up uh, to sustain the, the speaker's prejudice. Um, and uh, it had an aftermath that the driver who did this, who had been the Pope's driver when the Pope was in Australia, uh, he um, 
at, I think, a Christmas function of his family, uh, or certainly a family occasion, went out from the occasion uh, to a shed and hanged himself. And that was what he did, but the Member of Parliament remained in Parliament for a long while after, after that. And so that was a, if you will understand it, a very unpleasant and wrong thing to subject me to, but more importantly, to subject my partner. My partner had come down the night before for a dinner of the kind that you do if you're in an establishment type job. We had a dinner with the British High Commissioner at the High Court. Uh, and so he'd come down. He was very tired from driving down. Uh, I had to get up early and go to court. I didn't know that this speech had been made. And then suddenly all the phones lit up and everybody wanted to have a statement. I didn't know what they were talking about. Uh, no warning, uh, no notice, uh, and uh, sort of uh, just uh, a person elevating himself to be uh, accuser, uh, witness, um, and uh, jury, judge, prosecutor, executioner. And that's why system and procedure is so important in the legal system. And I rang uh, I had to go into court in a case, it's called Barclays Oysters. It's a, it's a case in the law of torts about negligence and it's all about effluent. It seemed a very, in retrospect, a very suitable case to be sitting on for three days whilst <laughs> this chaos was uh, unfolding around me. Um, but um, it, it was all over within a week. The senator resigned from the position in the cabinet and uh, apologised profusely. Mr Howard accepted the apology and, uh, and uh, so, uh, but um, what happened? Well, the only person really who crossed level nine in the High Court to see me and to ask how was I doing was Mary Gordon. Um, I, I don't, I can't say that I got a lot of support at that time. People, in fairness, are very embarrassed in a moment like that and, and uh, they don't quite know how what's going to happen. They didn't know it was a false document and so on. But uh, Mary Gordon just came over and as one human being to another, forget the High Court business, uh, said, how are you doing? How is Johan doing? And I said, I can't get through to him because he's still sleeping. Uh, and um, so that wasn't a nice experience. Was that homophobic? I think it was. I mean, what other explanation can there be that somebody would do that without notice to another office holder? Was it political? Yes, I think it was. Um, was it unpleasant? Certainly it was unpleasant. Did I survive? Yes, I survived. The test of people is when things are going hard. That's when we are morally tested as human beings in dealing with one another. So just keep that little story in your minds, in your future in life and in the law, that we are tested all the time and it's important to come out on the right side of the tests, as Mary Gordon many times did. And on coming out on the right side of the test, I suppose that goes to my next question. Um, a lot of us here would have participated in the uh, postal survey last year for marriage equality or same-sex marriage, and um, that was a, took a better part of a whole, whole year and more. Um, I suppose looking back at it now, now that same-sex marriage has been legalised in Australia, what did you make of the entire political debate and the process and going forward, um, how do you envisage, <laughs> <laughs> well I suppose a better part of the question is um, what did you make of that entire political debate? Well I certainly didn't agree with the process and I made that uh, completely clear at the time. It is not the process in Australia that is laid down by our constitution that we farm things out there. We outsource things 
to be decided uh, by um, uh, people screaming at each other in the streets. We have a representative democracy, and that's for a very good reason, that if you'd have to do things within a, uh, a chamber of a parliament, then there has to be a degree of formality, there is a transcript, there have, and in a space, when people are in a space, and I saw this recently when I was in New York in the Security Council when the annual resolutions on North Korea came onto this, into that beautiful room in Manhattan. Uh, when people are together, there, there is a, a, there's a sort of psychological impetus to at least be civil and sometimes to try to find solutions. That's the nature of representative democracy. Uh, but um, in terms of the plebiscite or the sort of postal ballot, I didn't agree with that at all. And uh, indeed, my partner Jan, who was uh, born in the Netherlands and uh, spent his first years under German occupation during the Second World War, and in the immediate aftermath of the war, the tremendous recriminations in the Netherlands for the collaboration with the Nazi occupiers, um, he said the one thing we learned, and it was repeated over and over again when I was a boy, is you do not cooperate with your oppressors. You do everything you can uh, to avoid getting into more trouble, but you do not cooperate. And he said, why should we cooperate with a process which has been invented by people who are deeply hostile to the notion that we should have equality of civil rights under the law of this secular country? Why should we cooperate? So originally we thought we won't cooperate, but eventually um, I, I persuaded him that we shouldn't give a free kick to the uh, hostile people. And so we cast our vote and we were pleased at the outcome and in fact the outcome then led very quickly to the passage of the legislation through the federal parliament within, within a month. And um, at the time of the, of the postal survey, I went down to Wollongong because they gave me an honorary degree and I try to go there every year and I went down there to give some lectures at their law school. and. All along the way, um, it's not an area of Sydney I know very well, uh, there were churches along, I think it's, is it Princess Highway, whatever it is, uh, and all the way down there were these churches with big banners up, um, mostly Roman Catholic, but also some, of, some Anglican, and I'm an Anglican, so uh, all saying it's okay to vote no. And I didn't really think it was okay to vote no, because to, <laughs> to vote no was to deny other human beings uh, in a secular country the right to equality in the law, particularly in Australia where, according to the census, uh, the number of um, marriages that take place in churches has plummeted. The number of marriages straight marriages that take place now in Australia, it's, it's about 78% take place in vineyards, uh, parks, <laughs> uh, anywhere but a church. So how dare people then say, we're going to deny you the opportunity to have, uh, if the church could be found to marry you, uh, to marry you in a church or to marry you in a vineyard like everyone else or almost everyone else. Anyway, um, the outcome, I forget the exact figures, but it was about 60-40. So is that a wonderful result? Everybody at the time said, oh, this is wonderful, isn't it wonderful? 60% support us. We must be groveling and grateful that 60% support equality in the law. Well, I'm not all that grateful. I don't know that that was such a wonderful vote. That means that 40, four in 10 of my fellow citizens uh, though it wasn't impinging on their lives, it didn't want um, uh, Jan and me uh, 49 years and four months to have the facilities they, they can have just as of right. Um, but some sort of inflexible people take a long time to get their minds around new ideas, so I suppose uh, we must be grateful for small mercies, and it, it did 
Uh, and it's interesting that now when you ask Australians, you've seen this no doubt on the internet, what they're proud of, they say the marriage survey. <clears throat> they're proud that Australians voted in an inclusive way because white Australia, uh, women's uh, deprivations, Aboriginal uh, land rights and gay uh, criminalisation, uh, we, we were not all that generous in those matters. We were not inclusive. We were exclusive. It was a patriarchal, white um, and self-satisfied sort of society. So um, uh, I'm glad it came out as it did, but I'm not all that glad about the vote and I'm not all that glad that it's okay in some people's view. And especially because in the weeks before the Anglican church, my church, the church that I grew up in gave a million dollars to the No campaign and it could only find, I think it was $5,000 or $10,000 to the campaign against family violence, which itself is often the result of patriarchy. So that's not such a good uh, uh, thing to do. And it, it's really sad. Uh, Jan is not religious. He says, look, Michael, you're a reasonably intelligent person. <laughs> and I can't... I can't understand how you take any of that stuff seriously. All these old men in turbans in the desert all that while ago uh, laying down uh, these supposed rules. Why do you worry about it? Why don't you just give them all away? But I grew up with a spiritual life and with the Anglican belief and at least the Anglicans are now um, uh, uh, ordaining women and they're making steps and they're, they, I learned today of a famous Australian musician who's going to marry his partner or he's going to uh, have a ceremony in Perth and it's going to be performed in an Anglican church over there in Perth. It's not a marriage because that's against church, church law at the moment but it's a blessing. They're going to have a blessing and he wants that. He thinks marriage is sacramental. Well, I tell you as lawyers, marriage under the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Australia cannot be sacramental. It, that would not stand with section 116 of the Constitution. Uh, it is not sacramental. It is a secular, civil um, uh, entitlement, and now it's available to all uh, competent adult Australian citizens. Uh, but there are those people, four in 10, who didn't think that should be. How selfish, how, how narrow, and that my own church should take that view. It really makes you despair, but it'll get better, and it has got better. It's got better in my lifetime, but that doesn't release us all from the obligation, straight or gay, to push the envelope and make sure that uh, our history of discrimination and nastiness to groups especially minorities, that that has to be over. We have to be a country uh, that is an example to the world. And we have a chance because we're now such a mixed up country with so many different races, uh, more than virtually any other country on earth. So this is our chance, this is our challenge, and we're in the brink, uh, on the brink of uh, the most dynamic economies uh, in the world, in Asia, and we have a great chance in education and in welcoming people from other countries. Um, and we've just got to think bigger and be kinder and more inclusive. And I hope that will happen in the lifetime of the people and that the lawyers of the future in this room will contribute to that. Never give up. Keep working at it. Never give up. Never accept injustice and inequality. Well, I suppose that touches on my last question. I'm sure everyone here is very eager to ask their own questions. But on that, um, I suppose my question is, what advice would you have for people in my shoes or you know, other LGBTIQ identifying law students now studying at this law school? Well, one piece of advice, uh, and I don't think I really have to give this advice, I think people know it, is, uh, it is getting better, uh, it is getting better very rapidly. Uh, 
and it is better for yourself if you are open uh, and it's better I think for relationships uh, that you're not doing what I did in the early times of my relationship with Jan of ringing twice and then stopping and then ringing again. That was the code. He wouldn't answer the phone at home unless he got that code. Uh, that was so that no barrister or judge could get the shocking re revelation of a deep male voice at the other end of the phone if he phoned up. Um, so I think openness uh, uh, and uh, honesty uh, and um, engagement, but also learning from one's own uh, uh, discrimination that you, you, it's, it's of a kind. You have to you have to contribute to removing discrimination in all of its ugly forms, and uh, not just be obsessed about gay rights. You know, I'm not obsessed about gay rights. I'm, I'm concerned about all cases of discrimination and injustice. And, and secondly, um, to be concerned about uh, our region, because you know, we're, we're muddling our way to getting rid of the criminal laws and getting rid of the, um, the civil inequalities. But in our region, uh, there is an awful lot of violence and hatred. And in some countries, it's getting worse. Uh, Borneo has introduced in the last two years the death penalty, reintroduced it, because originally in uh, British colonial times, this was a death, this was a capital case. Uh, they've reintroduced it. Uh, Indonesia, which had been a, a relevant, relatively temperate sort of society, uh, is now under pressure to introduce criminal laws against gays. The Netherlands got rid of those, I think it was in 1806, uh, and therefore the criminal code of, the, of Indonesia, which is derived from the Netherlands, never had criminal laws against gays. And this is just a dear little gift from the British to every country where the Union Jack flew, uh, they got the sodomy laws. And um, so uh, I think uh, being concerned with the world, I'd say that generally, uh, but in this area of uh, the rainbow over Asia, I, I think it's a matter of being concerned in our region and doing what we can to reach out and uh, support um, LGBT groups and others in, in our region. Wasn't it interesting the other day when Weibo uh, was, uh, was, had a, a rule that they wouldn't allow any uh, messages about um, uh, gay uh, uh, groups and then uh, the People's Daily attacked that and said this is not necessary and this should be changed and this is completely unreasonable and so they backed off um, and so things are changing but they're not changing very fast and they're changing in the wrong direction in Indonesia, in Bangladesh, uh, in the Caribbean, uh, in many parts of Africa and uh, we as lawyers uh, must stand up about it and I'm going on Sunday to Oslo for the meeting of the um, Human Rights Institute of the International Bar Association, of which I am co-chairman with uh, Ambassador Hans Carell, who was general counsel to uh, Secretary General Kofi Annan in the, in the United Nations. Uh, we will be there dealing with a whole range of human rights issues of the world, but one of them will be the uh, oppression and violence against LGBTIQ people in our region and in the world. Well, thank you very much for that, Mr. Kirby.